So I was thinking last week, I don't really want to have to wait for Unity 7 to be able to use UI Toolkit in World Space. And I started doing some digging around the internet and decided to try something out. Today, as a simple example of how this can be done, I want to implement a little damaged number system using UI Toolkit in World Space. I want to build it in such a way that I can use it for other things in the future, like tooltips or health bars or any other UI element I want in World Space. So let's jump into Unity and see how this can be done. Okay, here in Unity, I've done a little bit of setup. I've created a few assets in my project that are going to act a little bit like prefabs. I've created a basic render texture. I've also created a simple panel settings, and I've also created a UI document. The contents of the UI document we could create programmatically, but because I only have one element, I've just created it in the UI builder. If I double click and open up the builder, you'll see that I've just got one element here, a label. It has minimal styling and a font applied. Of course, you can make these much more complicated and interactable, but for this demo, we're just going to show damage numbers and keep it really simple. Our goal today is to be able to show UI documents in world space. We're going to do this with a combination of a world space UI document, Unity's object pooling, and a tween sequence. If I press play here, you'll see exactly the effect that I'm going for. And if I expand the enemy game object, you can see all of these world space UI documents that are being pooled. We're just taking one out of the pool every time we want to show a damage number. And when the animation is finished, it gets returned back to the pool. So let's dive into code and see how we can make one of these world space UI components. To start with, I might want to render these either as a transparent UI or as something with a textured background. So let's store the names of the shaders we need as constants. We're also going to need to reference the main text variable of the shader. And rather than reference it by string, it's more performant to find it by its ID. Now we're going to need a few settings for the panel that we're going to display inside the game. Let's give it a width and a height and maybe a scale. We could increase the scale if we want to zoom in. We also need a pixels per world unit. This will determine the real world size of the panel. Then we also need references to the three assets I mentioned in the beginning, our visual tree asset, our panel settings asset, and our render texture. We're going to use these three assets to create a mesh renderer, a UI document, our own panel settings for this world UI document, a render texture for us to use here, and a material. That's a lot of screen real estate. So when I select it all and using the context menu, we can surround with a region. I'm just going to call this region fields. Now let's collapse that up and our using statements as well. Then we can write our code. Our world space UI document is going to be put on a prefab and the prefab is going to need to have some components and we're going to have to configure those components. Let's start with a method that will initialize a mesh renderer. We can use our get or add extension method to make sure that we have a mesh renderer on the game object and we can set most of its settings to the most basic. So let's keep this mesh renderer dead simple. Shared material equals null. Shadow casting mode off. Receive shadows false. Then we'll set the motion vector generation mode to the simplest one possible. Now, if you've never seen this before, motion vectors track the per pixel object velocity from one frame to the next. This is useful for applying image effects like motion blur, but we'll just set it to force no motion. Then we can turn light probe usage off and reflection probe usage off. We're also going to need a helper method that will give us a quad mesh. What we can do here is create a primitive of type quad. The quad is going to have a mesh filter component on it and we can grab its shared mesh. We'll store that, destroy our temporary quad and return the quad mesh. Now let's come up to the top and create another method that will initialize all the components that we need here. First, we can call the initialize mesh renderer method that we wrote. Then optionally, if you needed to, you could create a box collider for this. We could just set its size to a vector of 110. Now, I don't really need one for what I'm doing, so I'm just going to comment this out. But what I do need is a mesh filter. So I can get or add a mesh filter component here, and we're going to set its shared mesh to the quad mesh that we're pulling out of the primitive quad. With those things done, we've got all of our components onto this game object that we need. But we still need to build our UI panel that we're going to display in world space. Let's collapse all of these things up so that we have a little bit more room. In Rider, you can use the context menu to collapse as much as you want, including collapsing down to definitions. So let's come up to the top and we'll create a new method called build panel. We can actually break this one up into many smaller methods. So it'll handle little chunks of the logic. First, we're going to need a render texture where we're going to display our panel. We already have a reference to the render texture asset in my project. Its render texture descriptor struct contains all the information we need to create our own new render texture. 
We can set its width to our panel width setting, and we can do the same thing for the height. Then we'll be able to create a unique render texture for this game object by passing the descriptor into the constructor, and maybe we can also give it a unique name. So we'll make this step one of our build panel method. For step two, we'll create unique panel settings. We have a panel settings asset. Let's instantiate it. We need to set its target texture to be our render texture. Let's set its clear color to be true. This will clear the color buffer right before it's rendered. Scale mode to constant pixel size. We'll set its actual scale to be our panel scale setting. And we could also give it a name. Now let's add that as step two in our build panel method. After this, we can create a UI document. Let's make sure we have a UI document on this game object. Let's assign it the panel settings that we've configured, and let's also assign it the visual tree asset that we've referenced. We can add this method as step three in our build panel method, and we'll create another one to create a material we can use. Here we can use the alpha of the color clear value in the panel settings to decide whether or not it needs to be transparent. The default is zero, so in this example, we're gonna get a transparent shader. We can then create a new material using that shader, and we can set its main texture to be our render texture. This way, whatever game object we put this material on is gonna show our world space UI. Let's add this as step four in our build panel method. Now let's create a method that will set this material to render. Here we can say, as long as our mesh renderer is not null, let's assign the material that we just created to be the shared material of this mesh renderer. Then let's make one last helper. We'll call it set panel size. In the case where our render texture isn't null, but for some reason its width or height differs from what we've got in our settings, maybe we wanted to reset this at runtime, this method could release the texture, reset the width and height, and then call its create method again. After that, we can use the mark dirty repaint method to redraw the texture. Finally, let's configure the world space scaling of the game object to ensure that the real world size corresponds to the panel's pixel dimensions divided by pixels per unit. Let's come back to our build panel method and we can actually call both of these methods. Almost done. Now in our awake method, let's initialize our components and then we will build our panel. At runtime, we're also gonna to wanna to be able to change that label to show the right damage amount. Let's have a public method that allow us to do that. First, just as a sanity check, let's make sure that the visual tree asset was assigned to this UI document. Then we can find our label and assign the text. So now we're basically done with our world space UI document. Let's move on to being able to spawn these into the world. Our spawner is gonna be fairly straightforward, but I'm gonna bring in a few libraries. The first will be prime tween. I'm also gonna bring in unity engine.pool and our unity utils library. Then we can get started with a few references. First of all, we're going to make a prefab out of our world space UI document. And then I also want to have a float that'll represent some kind of randomness for my spawning. I don't want my damage numbers spawning in exactly the same place every time. We're going to store all of our world space UI documents in an object pool. And let's keep a constant so that we can reference the label inside of those documents. Then let's just have a public method so that we can spawn damage numbers. We can pass in an integer for the amount and a world position where we want it to spawn. We can use an extension method to add some randomness to that world position so that we know where we want to spawn our world space UI. Then let's grab an instance from the pool. We can set its position and rotation in one line, and then we can use its set label text method to actually update the value of the label. For the animation, let's calculate a position of how high up we want it to go, and then we're going to create a sequence with prime tween. First in our sequence, we're going to group a few things together. We'll move it towards the up position with a duration of 0.3. At the same time, we can scale its position up to about 1.5 with the same duration. When that group finishes, we'll chain in another animation to drop it down. This will take it to the inverse of the up position over a duration of 0.5. When the entire chain is finished, we're going to release the UI document back into the pool. So that's it for spawning our damage numbers, but we still actually have to set up our pool. Object pools in Unity require four methods. We need one to create or instantiate our prefab. We need to do something when we take it out of the pool, so we can just set it to be active. When we return it to the pool, we can deactivate it. And if it needs to be destroyed, we'll just call destroy on the game object. This way, in awake, we can just create a new object pool of type world space UI document and pass in all four of those methods. Now let's create a little enemy script so that we can actually test this out. Normally we could just inflict damage on the enemy one hit at a time, 
but since I want to test, I'm going to bring in the improved timers library. On top of that, since this is a simple demo, we can just serialize a reference to the damage number spawner. Normally though, I'd probably want to inject this or provide it from outside. Let's also just have a fixed damage amount and a fixed spawn interval. So in the future, we'd want to have a public method here where we can say take damage, then it would affect the health and maybe do some other logic, but it would also spawn a damage number based on whatever damage comes into that public method. But for our test, we can have a countdown timer, and in the start method, we can initialize the timer to the spawn interval. Every time the timer counts down to the end, we'll spawn a new damage number, and then we'll just start the timer again. And of course, we need to kick off the timer for the very first time. Almost ready for a test, but there's just one more thing. I've written a small component that will make sure that our world space UI always faces the camera. We don't need to go into this in too much detail because it's extremely simple. It'll either use a camera that I've serialized or it'll use the main camera. So let's go try this out. I've taken an empty game object and turned it into a prefab here that I've called world space UI. And on this game object, I've added our look at camera script. I've also added the world space UI document and given references to all three of those assets that I created at the very beginning of the video. So we have the visual tree asset, which was a UXML document, our panel settings and our render texture. If we take a look at my enemy in my scene, to this game object, I've added the enemy script. And for now, the damage number spawner can live on this game object as well. The damage number spawner needs a reference to our UI document prefab. So that we can really see what's going on here, I'm going to press pause before I hit play. That way we can just step through the first few frames. So here in play mode, I'll just step ahead a little bit until I see one of them spawn. Let's select that and let it come up just a little bit. And actually, I'm going to turn on gizmos. With the gizmos on, we'll be able to see the entire quad. And actually now we have a second one already starting to appear. So far, so good. Let's step ahead a little bit and maybe I can actually select the other one. Just make sure that everything looks correct. You can see they're starting to scale up as I step forward. And once they reach the apex there, they just start to drop down as per the animation. So if I let go of the pause button and just let it fly, you can see it just starts turning them out every 0.2 seconds. Here in game mode, we can see it looks pretty good. No matter what I do, the numbers are still facing the camera. So even though this was a fairly trivial example of how you can use UI Toolkit in world space, there's a lot of potential for doing more powerful things with it. You can start listening for different kinds of event callbacks by implementing different interfaces like eye pointer move handler or eye scroll handler. Or maybe you want to use UI Toolkit to show a health bar above the character's head that binds to player data. Anyway, even if you're just making tool tips and you feel like this is an approach you want to take, I'll leave a link to this code in the description of the video. I encourage you to take it and make it your own. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Feel free to join us on Discord if you like. Subscribe and hit the like button if you're interested in this kind of content. I'll throw something else up on the screen for you if you're not tired of the channel yet. Maybe I'll see you there.